Today we are going to take a look at Harry Potter. This is going to be the last of the lectures in the series that I've been putting together on hero mythology. And again, since we've been moving away from the ancient and the medieval material into the modern era, which we covered with the Chronicles of Narnia and the Voyage of the Dawn Treader last time, today we're going to be focusing on another seven volume series that is very much in the um, tradition of somebody like Tolkien and Lewis. So it's going to be the work by J.K. Rowling, Harry Potter, uh, and starting with the first book, The Philosopher's Stone, which is the book that I'm going to kind of, kind of focus on the most, though in the course of the lecture, I'm going to be moving on and covering bits and pieces of all of the material. And if you're not familiar with the Harry Potter material in general, I am going to have a lot of spoilers in here. So if you don't know how the whole story wraps up, you're about to learn a little bit about that. So let's take a look at... Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, a hero's alchemical transformation, to use a term that you might not be familiar with. You might not know anything about alchemy, but by the end of this lecture, I'm going to be introducing you to some basic concepts. We're not going to go too in-depth there, but we're going to talk about some of the basic ideas and pursuits of alchemy as it relates to the hero's transformation. Okay, So let's start by taking a look at the author of the work, J.K. Rowling. Uh, this is an interesting success story. Uh, she has a background. Her name is actually Joanne Rowling. She published under JK, and I'll tell you why that is in just a little bit. But her background is in classics, which when I found that out, I was very impressed because my background as well is in classics. But she got her BA in classics and French. I guess it was double major at the University of Exeter in Great Britain. Now, she eventually wrote the Harry Potter series, and the first book in that series came out in 1997. Uh, at the time, she was you know, financially not in a good spot, but as you could imagine with the success of this uh, series, not just the first book, but the entire series, that changed drastically. It was published by Bloomsbury in London and under the pen name of J.K. Rowling. Now, the reason she used the J.K. Uh, is probably in the grand tradition, again, somebody of people like C.S. Lewis or J.R.R. Tolkien, you know, using your initials when you're a fantasy author, I guess, is one of the requirements. Uh, even, you know, George R.R. R. Martin uh, puts his initials in there, too. But it was essentially to cover the fact that this was a woman writing fantasy literature, and the publishers really believed that the uh, you know, adolescent male audience for that kind of literature might not be interested in reading a work written by a female author. So she went with J.K., so they want to know. Jo uh, obviously, the J stands for her name. Uh, the K stands for her grandmother's name. She actually didn't have a middle name, so it stands for Kathleen in honor of her grandma. Anyways, the, the uh, series was a hit. Uh, the publication was a hit in Britain. And in the following year, 1998, it was picked up by the United States uh, publication, Scholastic Corporation, which published it under a different title. So originally, the Philosopher's Stone was transferred into the American public as the Sorcerer's Stone. Kind of a sad reason, you know, why they did that. At least maybe it's an insulting um, view of the American public as far as the publishers are concerned, but they believe that the American audience wouldn't be interested in reading something that had the word philosopher in the title. So they put sorcerer in its place because more people are interested in sorcery than philosophy. Um, I don't know what that's supposed to say about the intellect of the American population, but um, Rowling herself wasn't too happy with the title change. And of course, it's the Philosopher's Stone that's going to be one of the most important objects in the entire story. Uh, anyways, not only was the first book a bestseller, the entire series was a bestseller. As a matter of fact, as far as bestsellers go, this was the best-selling book series in history. Uh, currently, I think there are well over 500 million copies of this stuff published, and she ended up becoming the first author in history to become a billionaire. And it wasn't just off the publication of the books, it was off of the movies and all the other stuff that went along with it. Um, but she was able to capitalize on her great skill. And um, the big question, I guess, is why was it so popular? You know, as, as opposed to some of the other authors that came before her that did fantastic work. I mean, you think of, you know, well-known names in fiction like uh, Stephen King and, again, Tolkien, Lewis themselves. That was, the, that was earlier in the 20th century. Um, but... You know, she's definitely surpassed them. So again, the question, why? That may say something actually about our need as a culture for, not maybe just a culture, but, you know, human need in general, because all cultures seem to have this need for mythology, right? Need for myth, a craving for a sense of wonder and something that's transcendent that'll take them out of, you know, the average person out of their everyday ordinary existence. 
So I think the popularity of the books really relates to maybe the mythological or even the religious function that these stories provide to people. So if you remember the name Mercialiade, this is a uh, historian of religion that I mentioned earlier in the semester. He acknowledged that human beings are generally inclined towards experience of the sacred. Okay, He actually believed that humans tend to pursue these transcendent experiences, even when the culture that they live in denies an actual spiritual reality or spiritual dimension to reality. Um, I got a quote from him. It says, non-religious man in the pure state is a comparatively rare phenomenon, even in the most desacralized of modern societies. And he goes on to say that the majority of the irreligious still behave religiously, even though they're not aware of that fact. And when we refer not only to, or sorry, we refer not only to the to modern man's many superstitions and taboos, all of them magico, religious, and structure, but the modern man who feels and claims that he is non-religious still retains a large stock of camouflage myths and generated rituals. So over the course of the semester, when we're looking at these stories, right, the mythology and the ritual and the different religious traditions from you know ancient Mesopotamian religion all the way through to Greek, Roman, and then Christianity, you know, you see elements that have trickled through, right, filtered into our language. We have a lot of these things that really pervade our culture, which is one of the important things about studying world mythology. Okay, but Eliade is actually saying something deeper than just we're impacted by these uh, little cultural incursions, but we're actually think in a certain way, right? So I think that's one of the reasons that the story was really so successful. Um, he even says that we engage in kind of the same religious activity when we read books. So for instance, you know, reading, he believes, has a mythological function, as would watching movies or watching sports or playing sports or even listening to music. Okay, These are all ways that he would say are um, geared towards escaping time. Right? He has this big element of his thinking as, uh, that has to do with time, right? really, really an escape from the mundane place that we're in right now, kind of the secularized world, and, and it brings you into something beyond yourself, right? It's um, living a, another history, right? When you enter a, a movie theater, when you enter a good novel, you're, you're transported from your world into another world, okay? And that's a religious experience, that, you know, what Eliade would call a religious experience. So it's going from the here and now to something beyond the here and now. So I think Rawlings' work does that obviously it does that but i think one of the things that it does the best is it provides a very different world from the world we're used to right that's why it's as I, as I say especially true of the harry potter series right the whole realm is a realm of magic and fantastic so let's take a look very briefly at the seven books what the titles are if you're not familiar with the entire series starting with the harry potter uh, book known as the philosopher's stone again 1997 that came out uh, chamber of secrets came out the following year followed by The Prisoner of Azkaban, 99, and The Goblet of Fire in 2000. Now, they were pretty much back-to-back, -back, um, year after year, kind of the way Lewis published the original Chronicles of Narnia. After The Goblet of Fire, there was a little bit of a wait for the fans because the books did get a lot longer at that point. So Order of the Phoenix came out in 2003, Half-Blood Prince, 2005, and finally The Deathly Hallows, which is by far the biggest, if I'm thinking correctly, I think it is the biggest of the series, so it's pretty close to Half-Blood Prince. I actually have them on my bookshelf right next to me. I should probably just peek over and see which one's the thickest. Anyways, um, that's the seven in the series. And there are other books that she wrote related to the Harry Potter world, as well as other books in general. Um, I forget her pen name. She actually writes some crime novels as well under a, a male pen name. Uh, it slipped my mind right now what it is, but... If you're interested in other Harry Potter material, she's written um, things like Quidditch Through the Ages, The Tales of Beetle the Bard, um, some other short stories that deal with Hogwarts. A lot of this stuff is actually available through ebook format on her website. She's got a J.K. Rowling website, and she also runs the Pottermore website. But more recently, she has gotten into screenwriting, and she's written the screenplay for the two most recent Harry Potter movies up to this point, which would be Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, and then Fantastic Beasts, The Crimes of Grindelwald, kind of a prequel uh, of sorts to the Harry Potter series. Right? It's still the same world, but it's years, years earlier. So again, if you're interested in the entire world, there's plenty of stuff, and I'm sure she's going to keep producing it. Uh, but interestingly, despite the series' incredible popularity, 
and its incredible success, the reception was not universally positive. You actually had a pretty negative backlash to Harry Potter in the early years. It was generally due to the Christian community in the United States reacting by banning and in some cases even burning the books as the visual here uh, displays. There were actually some articles in a number of big magazines like even Forbes which talked about this phenomenon. Um, There's a reverend of St. Edward's Catholic School, wherever that is, that decided to actually ban the entire series from the school library uh, without you know, consulting the parents, the teachers, the school administrators. He just went ahead and did that because he thought it was a uh, corrupting influence on the youth. So that type of thing was, I remember it being in the news quite a bit back when these books were first coming out. Um, and you could ask all kinds of questions as to why that was. Here's kind of a close-up. You could see the J.K. Rowling book right there circled for you. Um, I don't know what the other books are in this, uh, you know, bonfire, but I'm sure there are other books um, that were deemed just as bad. Anyways, from a Christian perspective, you have to actually step back and take a little bit of a of a look and try to put yourself in the point of view of the people doing the book burning. Uh, the problem I think a lot of these guys had was the use of magic in the material. Uh, you know, presenting witchcraft, the occult, in, in what might be a positive light, which is something that's definitely contrary to the religion, right? Christianity, uh, Judaism, you know, the monotheistic traditions in general tend to have a uh, anti-magical um, view. So, for instance, you could find a number of passages in the scriptures that deal with this kind of stuff, starting, you know, all the way back in the Hebrew scriptures like Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, in the 18th chapter, talks about I should read the passage here, a couple of verses, uh, verse 10 and 12. It says, no, no one be found among you who sacrifices their sons or daughters in the fire. Now, of course, that part sounds pretty bad. Uh, I don't think most people would want to have that practice resumed. But it goes on to say, who practice divination or sorcery, interpret omens, engage in witchcraft or cast spells, or who is a medium or spiritist or who consults the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. So you get this pretty harsh condemnation of all that kind of material. So I think it makes sense that you know certain religious groups would react this way. But why such a reaction to Rowling in particular, right? We've already looked at the fact that you've got other books by Christian authors that use magic pretty prevalently as well, like, you know, Lewis and Tolkien. Um, Anyways, they didn't have much of a problem with Lewis and Tolkien. And it can't be as simple as, you know, the bad guys that use magic in the Narnia or the Middle Earth series, because that's not always the case in those books. Uh, You can't make the case that the stories take place in a different world, whereas Rowling's world is our world. Uh, You can't make the case that uh, it takes place in a different time, like Lord of the Rings is, you know, set way in the past, whereas, again, Harry Potter is set in the present. Um, Or you can't even make the case that the themes in Lewis and Tolkien are clearly Christian, where Rowling's are not, okay? Because on all of these points, there are... uh, no real distinction when you really press it a little bit further, as we'll see in a little bit. Nonetheless, this is kind of the case that's often been made. There's been people on both sides of kind of a Christian debate as to the value of this series. Uh, I'll give you a couple examples of some authors that take contrary points of view. Richard Abanis um, actually tries to make the case against Harry Potter and a book that he wrote right there, uh, Harry Potter, Narnia, and the Lord of the Rings, is a book that kind of contrasts Narnia, Lord of the Rings, to Harry Potter and tries to show how those are different, significantly different from Harry Potter. Others, like Granger, John Granger, uh, tried to show that the the, the book is not only not anti-Christian, but is actually inherently Christian. So he takes a very, very radically different viewpoint. Um, Now, Lewis, right, the Chronicles of Narnia, his septology, or septilogy, or whatever you want to call it, the seven-book series, may be overtly Christian, right? It has a purpose, as we saw when we studied Narnia, of bringing forth a a Christian message in an allegorical form. Rowling is actually using a lot of Christian symbolism and Christian themes, but apparently without some kind of intentional religious message or purpose, okay? So I think she's clearly writing something very different, at least with its goal, than what Lewis was doing. But it's the Christian themes that I think are also worth talking about because I think they're in there, and they're in there for probably a few different reasons. So let's take a look at this Christian worldview that has become literally a part of the Western literary tradition. Right. Rowling is working in the same 
Christian literary tradition that we saw emerge with the Arthurian materials, right? We traced the evolution of King Arthur material. And she incorporates implicit and explicit Christian spirituality and imagery in the course of her work. Not to convert, right? Not to you know, press forward uh, a particular faith, but really just out of her own background, right? She was Anglican, right? So she actually grew up in a Christian culture. And Christian ideas and imagery are layered, you know, historically with older mythological concepts and symbols. And, uh, you know, that was already done prior to um, the arrival today. And a lot of these things have been filled with Christian meaning over the centuries, including images like, uh, you know, unicorns and centaurs and griffins and phoenixes and all the different magical beasts. A lot of those have symbolic meaning, even though a lot of them are pre-Christian creatures and mythological symbols, they end up being filled with Christian symbolization over time. Okay, so you can't escape from that. If she's going to use those types of things in her fantasy literature, she's going to bring with it certain ideas that have kind of been attached, um, not due to her own making. So anyways, let's talk a little bit about magic, since that seems to be the biggest objection by the people that were banning and burning her books. Now, Granger, in his writing, tries to make a case that the tradition of Western literary tradition has distinguished a couple of different types of magic in how it's used in literature. So, for instance, um, each type of magic which he presents has a different narrative effect. So within literary tradition, you've got what, what he calls incantational magic and what he calls invocational magic. So what's exactly the difference here? And is there really a difference that's significant? That could be something we can question. But he tries to make the case that one of them is creative and the other one is more corruptive. All right. The power of creation goes all the way back to the earliest myths that we have. Right? It goes back to the beginning of the semester when we talked about the Enuma Elish. It starts off with this idea of before things were named. And it goes in, puts a lot of emphasis on this idea of naming things, which has to do again with words. Uh, the Genesis account, which we also read, the beginning, you know, God created the heavens and the earth. He spoke. Right? He said, God said, let there be, and of course, things were created by word of mouth. So this idea of naming and creation are connected. And naming, we could think of as a way of giving existence to an essence. Think of yourself as a creator, or imagine yourself as a creator. You might come up with a, uh, a story plot, or you might come up with an idea for a work of art, a painting, or a sculpture, or something like that. First thing you do is you come up with the, what it is in your mind, right? That would be its essence. And then you give it existence through your actions. Okay, of course, if it's poetry, you can imagine doing this verbally, right? We would recite the poetry, and we, you know, it's like giving birth, right? Something new and creative is coming into existence that wasn't there before. So that's the creative motif. Now, incantational magic is the idea of singing along with. That's what incantation means. Cantare in Latin means to sing, so to sing along with. This is the type of magic that we can think of as a harmonization, right? So harmonizing with God's creative word, what we might call the logos. It's a Greek word that refers to the word of God in the New Testament. I was particularly attached to the figure of Christ in the Gospel of John. All right, so it's this idea of touching, on, uh, touching the spiritual realm, the transcendent, and it is not occultic. The way it's used in literary tradition is it's not as some kind of occultic, forbidden, demonic um, powers or anything like that. It's part of this long, long tradition in English fantasy literature, so you see this all over the place. Now, on the other hand, Granger makes the case that the invocational magic, which is drawn from the Latin word vocare, which is to um, to call is basically this type of stuff where you're calling in powers, right? Forbidden powers from the psychic realm or the soulish realm or something like that. So we're talking about this other type of thing going on. It usually results in contact with the demonic or angelic forces or something embedded within creation. And this tends to be viewed as the occultic type of magic within the literary tradition. Now, I'm not speaking about magic in general. I know there's different viewpoints on magic uh, particularly in the modern era, because magic is something that's been more and more revived with different religious movements today, like Wicca and um, you know re returns to paganism and things like that. But in the literary tradition, uh, this was generally associated with the, the demonic powers, 
Okay, so for instance, if you're familiar with a, a character like Faust, it's a guy who you know sells his soul to the devil, right? You've got a lot of stories like that where you're having powers called upon. Uh, a lot of horror films that you get out of Hollywood are dealing with that type of thing. These you know uh, horrible, corruptive spirits when you're m messing with the wrong types of magic. Okay, but that's again a long literary tradition, and this is the tradition that Rowling is working in. Now, the magical quality of the fantasy world actually creates a contrast with the modern, secularized, and demystified world that we live in, right? which tends to be very scientific, um, and the mystery is kind of being dispersed as we you know, start to learn more and more about the world around us. Now, when you look at a world like Rowling has created, there's an implicit acknowledgement of something beyond right? The, phys the physical, some kind of immaterial or spiritual reality, which would be the world of the intangible, like things like truth and beauty and virtue and uh, mystery in general. Right? Now, you don't have to buy that, but that might be why this story was so incredibly popular. Right? And the distinction might be irrelevant between incantational magic and invocational magic. I guess that's up to the individual. You know, some of the people that have burned these books and banned these books actually believe that when you look at Harry Potter, there were actual curses, actual spells um, that could actually do negative things in the world. So they believe that you know, Rowling had done a lot of research into the occult when she put together the work. So they were really, really wary of that kind of negative impact. But what you might not realize is that Rowling didn't do a lot of research into the occult when she created her world. As a matter of fact, the research she did, she says, was really in the region of alchemy. Now, if you don't know what alchemy is, this really is a science, and I'll put that in quotes, of transformation. Right? It's this idea of what we might call transubstantiation. And that word, I know, is filled with Christian significance. I'm going to unpack that a little bit later. Right? So... Um, something explored and written about by a number of scholars when it comes to mythology. So if you want to find a book on alchemy written by, you know, important thinkers in the realm of mythology, you could pick up somebody like Mercy Eliade, uh, Carl Jung, both of those guys wrote on alchemy. But I want to actually deal with alchemy a little bit later. So since I brought up this idea of transubstantiation and it has religious implications, I want to discuss maybe the Christian themes and imagery that are central to the entire theory, I'm sorry, the, uh, the, series at this point. And then we'll go and look at the mythological hero's journey motif as Rowling uses that in the story as well. And then we'll go back to alchemy nearing the end. Okay, so that's kind of what I'm going to set up right now. So let's take a look at Christian themes, Christian symbolism, because they are literally everywhere in this story. And the first one would be the most obvious, the idea of good versus evil. That's pretty standard in you know, all kinds of stories. And it's not necessarily specifically Christian, but it's definitely not unchristian. Okay, this is a huge theme in Christianity. And the lines in Harry Potter are very clearly drawn. You know who the good guys are, you know who the bad guys are, with a few exceptions. So for instance, we can look at um, the two houses, Gryffindor and Slytherin. Both of those um, are kind of antitheses. They're kind of, uh, you know, pitted against each other. Not that the Gryffindor, I'm sorry, the Slytherins are completely evil. This is just, you know, one of the houses of the school. But it's interesting to note that the Gryffindor common house is up in the tower. And the Slytherin common house is down in the dungeon, right? So it's got this idea of the separation between the upper world and then the lower world. Heaven and hell, kind of a distinction. And, and Rowling is really, really careful at bringing in all kinds of little clues and, um, you know, little pieces that you need to decode as you're looking at this because she's drawing on these themes. I mean, there's nothing by accident happens to find its way into the book. It's all very intentional. Various characters, Dumbledore, on the side of the good, very clearly a good figure. And of course, he has his phoenix, which is his um, companion, his, um, his pet, basically. Phoenix we'll talk about a little bit later as far as its symbolic significance. But as opposed to the other side, you've got Voldemort and he's got a snake. All right, so you got the good guy, the bad guy, great, powerful wizard, wizard, with, mm, wizards. The phoenix, of course, is a bird, so it flies up above. The snake kind of slithers down below, really, again, drawing this line between the high heavenly and the low hell. Um, okay, anyways, <clears throat> you get the, the other groups, like the Order of the Phoenix versus the Death Eaters. You've got characters like Lily and James Potter on one hand, and you've got the Malfoy family on the other. And, of course, their children, Harry, clearly on the side of good, and Draco, who's a little bit indecisive, a little bit conflicted, but usually is lined in or placed into the, the negative camp. Okay, I think things change a little bit nearing the end of the story, but never absolutely completely. So 
it's very clear who the good guys are, who the bad guys are. Um, there are some characters, obviously, that we don't know, like Snape, for instance, really not sure of his motivation, where he lines up until nearly the end of the whole series. But I think that's one of the reasons this is good writing, right? You got this idea of verisimilitude. You know, Draco, like I said, is conflicted. Snape, we're uncertain of. Other characters, even Harry, has his flaws. I mean, he's not a perfect character. None of the good guys are perfect, unflawed characters. Even Dumbledore makes some serious mistakes. Um, and none of the bad guys, with maybe the exception of Voldemort, are completely corrupt. There's even glimpses of um, virtue within the Malfoy family. But you don't have these two dimensional flat characters. And I think that's important, right? This is, I think, the sign, like I said, of good writing. Next, we could take a look at other Christian symbols, um, such as the snake and the phoenix, which I just brought up. So let's take a look at the snake, first of all. Clearly, the snake has a long history in mythology, both positive and negative, right? It's a symbol of fertility and various things, but you also have this long tradition of the dragon slayer stories, where the dragon is clearly the thing that needs to be vanquished, needs to be destroyed. You can all the way go back to, um, you know, the Garden of Eden, the very first really uh, story where the, where the serpent is clearly evil, a uh, deceptor uh, or deceiver, um, the source of evil in the world. So very much in line with that, you've got the image, you know, transferred here. And the bad guy, you know, his snake, Voldemort's snake, Nagini, which happens to come from the Indian word for um, a snake, Naga. So you've got that symbol. Then you have the symbol of the phoenix. The phoenix is uh, named Fox. Fox the phoenix is the, uh, the bird of Dumbledore. This is essentially the resurrection bird. And we've seen this type of creature in mythology earlier when we did the uh, story of Esfandiar, right? the Persian myth. Uh, you have this bird of marvel, the Smurg. Uh, it's a bird that arises from the ashes, gets reborn from the fire. So it's, it really is the idea of resurrection. And therefore, it is essentially a symbol of Christ, as is the next symbol, which is the philosopher's stone itself, which was related to the idea of alchemy, which we're going to come back to, I promise. But it's uh, something that produces what's called the elixir of immortality. If you remember, even when we looked at the story of the Holy Grail, uh, there were traditions where the Grail itself was conceived of as a gemstone. Okay, probably connected to this idea um, in, in you know, Renaissance writing, or Renaissance era, that it was a very, you know, alchemy was incredibly popular at that time as is the symbol of the griffin. Okay, so we've got tons of symbols. I'm not going to go through every single creature or whatever in the whole series, but the griffin also has some interesting significance as a Christian symbol. And you might not realize that the griffin door, for the first, first of all, is based on the idea of a griffin. Now, griffin door most likely means something like the golden griffin. And the banner, as you look at it, there's not a griffin actually on the banner. Uh, most people don't realize that it's just a lion. There's nothing that's really griffin about it except for the lion aspect. So the lion itself is a Christ symbol, as we already saw when we dealt with Narnia, right? Aslan is not a lion by accident. It goes back to this idea of the lion of the tribe of Judah that you find in the Bible. So Christ is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Now, the reason you have a griffin that's even more symbolic of Christ is because the griffin is a composite beast. I mean, we find griffins in mythology. We can go all the way back to the ancient Greeks in this vase painting here. It's a red figure vase painting. You see the griffin. If you look at the, the, the visage here, you're looking at what's a composite of two creatures. You have an eagle and you have a lion together, which is a creature now that has two natures to it. So if you know anything about Christian theology, when we talk about the figure of Christ, you know, Orthodox theology says that this is a person who has two natures. He's both God and man. You know, fully God, fully man is kind of the confessional view of this. So the two-natured person is represented here by a two-natured creature. And interestingly, the lion is viewed as the king of the earth, right? The king of the animals, king of the beasts. And the eagle is the king of the heavens. So not only is it two natured, but it's also king of heaven, king of earth. So again, it's very, very much um, filled with Christian significance. So you can see, as I was saying before, how pagan imagery is attached to Christian ideas as these things move through time, All right? It's an evolution of the concept, all right? Now, since we're already talking about the resurrection bird and uh, symbols of Christ, let's go on and talk a little bit about resurrection and the actual story of Harry Potter because that's a major, major theme. As a matter of fact, one of the major themes of Harry Potter is the idea of life, death, and love. 
all of which are important elements in Christianity. So I'd say this is, might be the theme that links the entire series together. It might be the core theme of the entire book series, period. So let's talk about some of the characters where we're going to look at this contrast between life and death, starting with the character most attached to death, which is Voldemort. Now, Voldemort's name probably comes from a couple Latin words as well. It might be translated as something as willing death, right? Now, willing death would be appropriate because he's the type of guy that has no problem killing people and murdering people and has done a lot of that. Now, it's also ironic at the same time because where it might mean willing death, he himself is completely terrified of death. Right? This is his greatest fear, and his fear totally controls him. Right? He becomes a killer in order to try to preserve his soul, right? to make these things called the horcruxes. But in doing so, he actually shatters his soul. I mean, that's part of the deal, is you break your soul into different pieces and hide them away so that they can never be eliminated right? if you hide them carefully enough. But again, the whole act of murder, the act of killing, is a corrupting thing. He is, uh, especially when the story starts, a, a succubus. He's a vampire. He is somebody who lives off of other people. He is a parasite. He steals life so that he might live, right? And he does this through murder, which makes him completely horrible. Now, Harry Potter, to your contrast, right? He's the antithesis to Voldemort. There are a lot of similarities, but at the same time, the differences are the ones that are most significant. He is actually the one who's willing to, death in the sense that he's willing to die, yet he attains life ultimately in the story. He's courageous. He's self-sacrificial. He's the brave hero that cares about others and stands for all the virtues. Even though he's got this connection to Voldemort, he's very different from Voldemort. Okay, So that's the important part about Harry Potter. He represents life. And we're going to learn through their interaction exactly what the difference is between Voldemort's approach to seeking life and Harry Potter's willingness to give up life. And it all has to do with the key to the whole thing, which is the element of love. Okay, so I think this is, you know, the idea and the message being that death can be transcended by sacrificial love. And if that's not an intensely Christian theme, I don't know what is. And this actually shows up with a number of characters over the course of the series. So if you look at the fact that Lily Potter, Harry's mother, actually dies protecting her infant son, you know, that's this idea of sacrificial love. You see the same thing with Dumbledore. You see the same thing with Snape. There are a number of characters, including Harry, that are willing to die for the good, right? For the good to attain something. And that's a more powerful magic. It's why when Harry locks wands with Voldemort, Harry ultimately is too powerful, especially in the end, for Voldemort, right? It's, you know, like Narnia, uh, you know, when Aslan talks about the deeper magic from before the dawn of time, that has to do with self-sacrificial love. That's exactly what rose Aslan from the dead in Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, right? So Voldemort rejects love, right? So his quest for immortality um, is absolutely futile. He's kind of like a dark Gilgamesh. He's going to fail the way Gilgamesh failed. Um, and because he has no love, he's not going to attain life. He actually is going to die by the end of the series. Okay, so other Christian themes dealing with this idea of resurrection. Let's go ahead and, uh, go ahead and talk about um, Philosopher's Stone, Conquest of Death, right? Death and resurrection, key elements in the heroic transformation. We've been talking about this all along throughout the lecture um, series, the catabasis, right? The um, personal transformation requires some type of death. So you would expect the hero to have to die in some sense, right? Maybe not physically, but at least in a symbolic way. He has to die and rise again to become somebody new, which makes Harry Potter really another Christ figure himself, right? And he doesn't just die once. He dies in the Philosopher's Stone, which you might not even realize if you haven't, you know, paid close enough attention, because literally, no, he doesn't die in the Philosopher's Stone, but in a symbolic fashion, he does. So the interesting thing about the story is he doesn't die just once throughout the series. He actually dies in every single book of the series. He has a descent into the underworld, and then he returns to life. So in the Philosopher's Stone, I think it's fairly clear how Rowling sets it up. When you get near the end of the book, you're in this quest for the Philosopher's Stone. That's the boon, right? That's the, the thing that represents life that everybody's searching for. And Harry, Hermione, and Ron go into the underworld. And you know they're going into the underworld. They're actually going through a trap door, which is guarded by Fluffy, the three-headed guard dog, which anybody that knows Greek mythology would already know this is Cerberus. So you know he's descending into hell. 
at this point. And there are going to be challenges, right? He goes through a number of different challenges to get to the final room where the um, Philosopher's Stone rests. Like all descents into hell, you've got to go through stages. If it's not, you know, Esfandiar's journey to the Brass Fortress through the Seven Stages or Dante's descent in the Inferno, you've got this idea of descending through stages. He encounters death multiple times, and in the end, finally, with Voldemort and Quirrell. Quirrell, of course, the professor of dark arts who is the host of what remains at this point of Voldemort, kind of this two-headed character that Harry has to deal with as he tries to attain the symbol of life that's down there, which is the stone, the Philosopher's Stone itself. Now, after he touches Quirrell, and, of course, Quirrell ends up disintegrating and, uh, you know, breaking down into dust and Harry himself is, you know, dealing with intense pain, he starts to fall to the ground. And the way she describes it in the book is that he he knew all was lost and fell into blackness. Down, 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 she says. And the next thing you know is Harry wakes up. Okay? But the cool thing is you gotta notice how long he was asleep, how long he was unconscious. Because she says he wakes up three days later. Now that, I think, is being drawn from the idea of the death of Christ in the New Testament. He dies in the crucifixion, and then it's three days later that he rises from the dead. So I think she's doing something symbolic with this scene. And I think she goes ahead and, like I said, does that with each and every book. So that's the Philosopher's Stone. Let's look at the rest of the series and how she has the at least symbolic deaths and resurrections in each one. In the Chamber of Secrets, um, they're looking for the for the lair, right? The Chamber of Secrets itself, where the basilisk lies down below. Okay, so they go through this chute in the bathroom all the way down to the um, the world below Hogwarts. Again, it's a descent into death, and what he encounters there is um, Tom Riddle, which happens to be a younger version of Voldemort. It's not really him, but it's kind of a part of him that resides there in, in this Horcrux. Um, there's a symbol of life that's there as well, the phoenix. Okay, so he has to um, actually save Harry Potter's life because Harry is stabbed with the, venil- um, the basilisk fang. He's poisoned. He's dying. And, of course, it's the resurrection bird that saves him and flies him up out of the underworld. So, again, you've got a resurrection through Fe- uh, Fox the Phoenix. In the third book, Prisoner of Azkaban, it's going underneath the willow tree, the Whomping Willow, right, where they go into this dark place into the shack. Um, He deals with the mentors in the story, and you have the scene near the end where he's at the lake, right at the edge of the water. As we already know, crossing over the underworld usually involves crossing a body of water, and here's this lake. It's dark. It's nighttime. These dementors are trying to attack him, and they're literally sucking his life force out of him, and he falls to the ground, and it's at that moment that this Patronus, this this you know silver stag comes bounding across the water and drives the Dementors away and saves him. A stag tended to be a type of character again in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance that ended up being a symbol of Christ as well. So you've got this idea of him being saved again from death. The moment of death, he's resurrected again symbolically. Goblet of Fire. It's even more obvious because the entire culmination of the various tasks in that book uh, bring him to a labyrinth. Right, that inward journey into the belly of the whale, into the graveyard. Because literally at the end of the uh, labyrinth, he's transported to a graveyard where he witnesses the rebirth of Voldemort, encounters evil, almost incarnate. Um, he's saved in a way by the Phoenix Song, and the port key transports him out of the realm of the dead back um, to Hogwarts. Again, a very brief death resurrection scene. Okay. Order the Phoenix. They go again into the underworld. They descend this time into the Ministry of Magic, which happens to be underneath London, right? So it's a descent. He encounters Voldemort. There's a battle. The Phoenix is present. He has a port key, which transports him back to the land of the upper world. So you've got another death and resurrection. Half-Blood Prince. This comes a little bit earlier in the story. Um, This might be the neatest one where they go into this dark cave, right? First, they sail across the water, the waters of death into this dark cave, onto this little island where he has uh, Dumbledore is trying to get one of the Horcruxes. And what happens while Dumbledore is going through his agony up above, Harry is dragged under the water by these um, dead in fairy, right? These uh, zombie-like creatures that come up and pull him down under the water into his, his, his watery grave and until Dumbledore himself comes to him, basically saves him. Right, he's, he's kind of a Christ figure himself. Dumbledore, Gandalf, a lot of those, you know, white wizard figures kind of fit the bill. 
And then he teleports him out through apparition. So again, he saved from his death and the resurrection. And then in the final book, it's not symbolic anymore, right? The final book, The Deathly Hallows, we actually witness the actual death of Harry Potter. He's killed in the book. Finds his um, kind of afterlife at King's Cross Station. Kind of a, a ghostly version of the train station. Um, just him, Dumbledore, um, what remains of Voldemort, very weak and pathetic. But he has this really interesting discussion there. I think if you have not read that book or seen the movie, um, that's one of the pivotal discussions that you have, all about life uh, and reality and things like that. But he ends up coming back. He has the choice at this point to reemerge, and he you know, faces off against the real Voldemort at the end of the story. Again, resurrected Harry with new power. And again, it's all because of the fact that he knows how to love, and he defeats Voldemort because Voldemort does not. So it's kind of powerful how she uses the, 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 the theme all the way along. And I love it when an author is consistently doing something like that. The next thing I want to look at is the hero's journey. So let's turn away from some Christian symbolization, which we'll probably touch on still as we go. But I want to look at the essential hero's motif in the monomyth. Okay? And we'll start by going back to things we talked about in the very beginning, such as the essential elements of a hero's story. Just to recap. Okay, it's a good time to review. Since we're at the end, we could talk about the transformation tale as involving two essential elements. And if you don't remember what those were, first is the adversary. And here we have Voldemort, right? He's going to be the catalyst of Harry's transformation. If it wasn't for Voldemort, Harry would never become the man that he is going to become. The second essential element is the conquest of death, which is exactly what we just talked about. Every single time he dies and rises and he evolves over the course of seven books. It's a long process before his transformation is complete. But all real transformations usually take time like that. I mean, we don't grow up overnight. So I like the way Rowling does this. A lot of the stories we read this semester, which are shorter myths, this happens immediately if it's going to happen at all. And in most movies where you have the hero, uh, the transformation is, again, pretty quick. So Harry's a little bit more realistic because it's dragged out over his adolescent years until he literally goes from being a boy to being a man. Going on with the common elements of the hero narrative, it's got all of these as well. So let's take a look at some of the common elements we've seen before. <clears throat> starting with the unique birth. Um, Harry definitely has a unique situation when he's a baby. It might not be the actual birth itself, but we said before, that doesn't matter so much. Something traumatic definitely happens when he's an infant in the crib, when his parents are killed by Voldemort, right? So that, I think, is the most important event. Obviously, it's the most important event because it ties him to Voldemort. The scar that he has, he wears ever since after that moment, right? It doesn't just scar him, you know, well, I should say it, just, it scars him in multiple ways, okay? Right after that, again, with now being orphaned, he must go into exile, as many heroes do. He's abandoned, basically, in a basket at the doorstep of his aunt and uncle. Um, and then he's not going to know who he is, so you've got the mystery of identity. He's raised with these people who are actually pretty pathetic and mistreat him. But again, this is a way to hide him from Voldemort. So it's Dumbledore and McGonagall and Hagrid that bring the baby and leave him on the doorstep. But we've seen, again, a lot of stories where babies have been exposed and left for somebody else to find and raise. So it's pretty standard Harry Potter stuff there. If you go on, we could also look at the next stage, which is going to be the prophecy. Now, the prophecy you don't find about find out about until later in the series. So in The Order of the Phoenix, we have this quest for the actual prophecy that has to do with who it is that's going to defeat Voldemort. Of course, it's Harry, right? You have the mentor figures and multiple mentor figures, Dumbledore being the most important, but lots of them. I mean, it's a school that he goes to. So uh, every teacher, in a way, is a mentor to Harry, uh, as well as other characters that come alongside in the course of his journey. You've got the call to adventure, right? He gets this uh, letter from the owl that drops off, inviting him to Hogwarts. This is in the very beginning, in the very first book. And his uncle tries to hide that from him, but ultimately it fails, and he is whisked off um, eventually by Hagrid to enter the world of magic. Um, so it begins the whole quest uh, and journey motif. Every book, there's some kind of quest, some kind of thing that they're seeking. Of course, in the first book, it's the, um, the Philosopher's Stone. By the end of the series, he's out to try to find all these horcruxes and destroy them. Okay, So a lot of quests and journeys along the, along the way. Then you've got things like the impossible task. Uh, again, multiple impossible tasks. I mean, every task that's difficult, you can consider it an impossible task. 
Uh, so, for instance, when he's doing the Triwizard Tournament, he starts off with our, um, what is it called? Um, obligatory dragon contest, right? He faces off against a dragon. doesn't have to kill it, luckily, but he does have to deal with the dragon um, to capture the egg that it has, where you have the next secret to the next task, and there's a next task after that, and on it goes. He has the challenge of the opposite sex, which is probably not the most important part about his hero's journey, but he does have a number of love interests over the course of the series, um, somewhat distracting to his main mission, but nothing that's really devastating. And then again, he has supernatural aid, which is really the entire world of magic. I mean, he's a person that has a wand for crying out loud, but he also has other people that come up and support him. Even his deceased parents show up and assist him in these moments of emergency, right? His father and mother show up in the graveyard with Voldemort in the, um, um, in the Goblet of Fire, right? So this is, again, supernatural aid routinely uh, present. Then we could talk about the last couple, which are going to be the Redemption, that might be a little bit harder to pinpoint, but there is a theme in the story about his relationship with his deceased father, at least his memory of his father, what he thinks of his father. He, of course, meets his father in spirit form, but he goes through a struggle trying to figure out who his father is. He has a pretty negative view of him throughout a couple of the books nearing the end. He starts to question whether his father was a good guy at all, uh, but eventually, you know, he, this is kind of resolved as he comes to know him. So there's that kind of redemption, father-son redemption, kind of like Darth Vader and Luke Skywalker. But the other redemption scene, I think, is clearly regarding the character of Snape, who in some ways is a father figure to Harry, even though he's kind of an abusive father for the most part. Um, but again, you find out more about what's going on with Snape, Snape by the end of the story, and there's an interesting redemption, I think, for him. The homecoming... Also, you've got to have at the end, and that's very, very brief. Um, you do have homecomings throughout the series, but in the end, of course, you have the final homecoming where you see in the last moments of the story, very, very brief, you know, what has become of Harry as he goes back and gets married and settles down and has children. Okay, so you've got the return. You've got the tragic end, which comes before the homecoming, uh, sometimes reversed in stories. I know Heracles has his homecoming before he dies. As a matter of fact, it's his homecoming that actually does him in when his wife accidentally kills him, but here Harry Potter dies, and then you have the apotheosis, which is where he becomes greater and more powerful than he was, and here's the scene from uh, King's Cross, this kind of mystical scene after he dies, where he encounters Dumbledore and has his final conversation. So again, all the common elements are in the story. The whole series really sticks to the pattern that's been set out through all these myths that have preceded. And like I said, Rowling knew mythology. She was a, a major in classics. She could not help but knowing how a good myth, myth uh, is supposed to be put together. Now, let's also talk about, very quickly, the family romance. This is something I introduced when we talked about the movie Thor. This was a, a Otto Rank's idea uh, that goes to the early years of the childhood of the hero, right? In his birth of the, uh, Myth of the Birth of the Hero book, he deals with this idea of the family romance, and we set out a number of stages, all of which actually are present in Harry Potter to more or lesser degree. So if we could talk about the uh, child being born of nobility. Here it's the, the idea of wizards. He's not a child of a king or a god, but he's definitely the son of a, a pretty unique couple of parents, right? Wizarding parents. The difficulty in his childhood is really with his um, the murder of his parents, and it's not really a difficulty in conception, so we could put a question mark near that one. But you do have a negative prophecy. You know, it's not a prophecy as bad as somebody like Paris that, you know, you're going to destroy Troy or like Mordred that you're going to destroy Camelot. But it is negative in the sense that there's a, a conflict that's going to revolve around this character Voldemort, uh, the Dark Lord. So this is the prophecy, as you find it in the Order of the Phoenix, uh, that was given to Sybil Trelawney, right? She's the uh, teacher who teaches uh, divination. Anyways, it reads like this. The one with the power to vanquish the Dark Lord approaches, born to those who have thrice defied him, born as the seventh month dies, and the Dark Lord will, Dark Lord will mark him as his equal, but he will have the power the Dark Lord knows not. And either must die at the hands of the other, for neither can live while the other survives. The one with the power to vanquish the Dark Lord will be born as the seventh month dies. 
So it's in this attempt to figure out who the savior figure is going to be. You have to know how to interpret the prophecy, but it obviously involves somebody dying that neither can live while the other survives. That's kind of the key line. And apparently there are several characters that could fit the prophecy. Of course, it's going to be Harry that does fulfill the prophecy, as you would expect, since he's the major character. He's exposed as a child, kind of not left in the water, the edge of the water like Romulus and Remus, but uh, exposed nonetheless on the doorstep of his aunt and uncle, which they raise him, they find him. They're the lowly people that you know, nurture him and bring him up. Um, you know, not the best of situations, but nonetheless, it's about hiding him. He's going to grow up and the hero is going to emerge. And then he's going to discover who his actual parents are. Or at least he finds out this really on this process of growing up. Okay, so he discovers who he is. He ultimately is reconciled with the father. He doesn't really have to take vengeance upon his father, but he does take vengeance upon the man that murdered his father, Voldemort. And then in the end, you've got this acknowledgement, this position of honor that he attains. So again, the family romance, she captures that as well, not just the general hero story. And if you want to even go further, and I'm not going to go through all 17 stages of Joseph Campbell's monomyth, but you could look at the story, <clears throat> excuse me, and you'll be able to find pretty much every one of the 17 stages at some point in the story as well. Okay, but at least you've got the idea of the general breakdown of that monomyth into the three main stages, the separation, the initiation, and the return. All of the stories follow that pattern. So I want to actually take a look a little bit about that because it's not just that the hero goes through that one time over the course of the series. He goes, goes through that throughout the entire seven-book series. He goes through it seven, seven times, separation, initiation, and return. So again, let's just take a brief look at how he does this and how she does this in each of the books, starting with the Philosopher's Stone. And the Philosopher's Stone, Act 1, starts at Privet Drive. Matter of fact, most of the books start at Privet Drive, which is the normal, ordinary world. Then he has to be separated. He has to depart for the world of magic and adventure. And this usually takes place in a few different ways, usually with some magical episode. So for the first book, Hagrid comes to visit him, takes him off to Diagon Alley as he's going to be enrolled in the school. In Act 3, which I didn't put the 3 on the screen, but in Act 3, he's going to return. This is at the end of the story, returns to Platform 9 and 3 quarters and back to the world, world where he grew up with the Dursleys because he's going to continue to go back to them pretty much every year after the school year ends. So you've got separation, initiation, return. Separation, initiation, return. In the second book, You've got Chamber of Secrets, same thing, Privet Drive. He's rescued by the Ford Anglia, the flying Ford Anglia, returns at the end to the platform. The third book, uh, he is taken from his home by the night bus. And this is, again, this magical bus brings him ultimately to the realm of magic. And at the end, he's back home where he started. The next book, Goblet of Fire, he arrives through flu power, flu powder, rather, flu powder to um, the magical uh, to Hogwarts, again, returns at the end. The next book, same thing. He's rescued by the Order of the Phoenix and returns at the end. The sixth book, he is picked up by Dumbledore from his home. And then at the end, they have a little bit of a difference because he doesn't return to Hogwarts. I'm sorry, return to Privet Drive. He actually returns. Um, they actually finish up the story at Dumbledore, um, Dumbledore's funeral, okay, in the sixth book. The seventh book, Starts out again at Privet Drive, so we know that he makes his way back there. But he's rescued by a number of people, a number of doppelgangers that are um, trying to hide his identity as they kind of smuggle him away from Voldemort and his forces. And, and uh, he, at the end, he ends up with the scene where he dies, r r rises, <clears throat> and returns to Hogwarts. And at the very end, of course, you've got the ultimate homecoming back to the world where you see him again at Platform 9 and 3 quarters. So again, she does the same thing, separation, initiation, return, over and over again. Now, in the course of going through multiple heroes' journeys, we can talk about his transformation. And there are, again, these three phases that we keep coming back to of the separation, initiation, and return. I want to look at them from a different point of view. So I've introduced the Campbell's terms. That's the most common way to refer to the three stages of the story. Uh, last time when we talked about Chronicles of Narnia, we took a religious twist on that, and we talked about a spiritual transformation that we find in Christian theology of you know, repentance, justification, and sanctification, how C.S. Lewis was using those ideas when you look at the transformation of Eustace, or even earlier, the transformation of uh, Edmund. In this story, I think Rowling is using a pattern that we might want to term the alchemical pattern, or alchemical formula. And the phases of alchemy, 
and I'll talk a little bit about what that is in just a second, uh, have to do with the what's called the magnum opus, or the great work, which involves stages disillusion, purification, and perfection, or the negredo, the albedo, and the rubedo stages. So the negredo stage is the stage of disillusion. The albedo stage is the stage of purification, and the rubedo stage is the stage of perfecting something. Now, Rawling, like I said, did some research into alchemy. Um, by the way, the background picture before I change slides is um, what's known as the squared circle. This is the emblem or symbol of alchemy. And interesting, it's the, uh, interesting uh, that it's pretty close to the symbol that we see in Harry Potter, known as the symbol of the Deathly Hallows, which I'll bring up in a little bit. Um, now, let's talk about Aristotle, because Aristotle, at least his philosophy, had a big impact on uh, alchemical thinking. And um, again, he's also the one that gives us kind of this three-stage breakdown. He's one of the first people that talks about how stories, a good drama, for instance, needs to be broken down into a beginning, a middle, and an end. It's where we get the idea of the three acts of the story in the three-act structure. Now, with the alchemical formula, you've got the three acts. You've got the three stages in the transformation. So there again is a squared circle and the, the uh, Deathly Hollow symbol right next to it. But the interesting thing, this interesting thing is Aristotle gives us the concepts, like I said, that are employed in alchemy. Now, alchemy, I said, was a quote-unquote scientific um, quest. Uh, we can actually call it maybe a proto-scientific quest, and it's a quest for immortality. Its goal is to produce something like the philosopher's stone, which is the elixir of life. It's this idea of transforming something. So another pursuit that the alchemists were after was a way to change something like lead into gold. Okay, this idea of transforming what is base and without value into something that's valuable. All right, this entire thing is a metaphor for change. Now, that process of changing a substance like lead into gold, we can call it transubstantiation. Now, if you're familiar with the term in religious circles, you know, the Roman Catholic Church has a doctrine of transubstantiation where you take the, the bread and wine at the Mass, and it's transformed literally into the body and blood of Christ. That's the dogma within the Roman Catholic Church. It's literally a miracle, and it's a transubstantiation. The substance of bread is replaced by the substance of the body of Christ. Same thing with the, uh, with the wine to blood. Okay, now, to understand in metaphysical terms what's going on, at least in a theoretical point of view, a lot of people employ Aristotelian terminology. So Arist Aristotle talks about substances as uh, individual things. So we could talk about a substance as a thing that is composed of a couple different principles, which we'd call form and matter. So everything that exists, including you, including uh, maybe the chair you're sitting on or the desk that you're in front of when you're in the classroom, those are substances that have both form and matter. And I'm going to use the example of a desk because I think it's pretty simple to do. If you walk into a classroom, you're going to see lots and lots of desks. Now, what makes the desk a desk is the fact that it has the form of a desk. That's why all the desks look alike and function alike and all that kind of stuff. So it's what gives the desk its essence. It's what makes it what it is, the form of the thing. Now, the matter is what makes the form instantiated in a way that distinguishes it from another instance of the same form. So when you're looking at a room filled with desks, you've got you know this desk over here on the left, this desk over here on the right, and they look the same. So they have the same form, but what they don't have the same is matter. It's matter that individuates the different desks. So for Aristotle, everything has both form and matter. So when you get to alchemy later on, you know, this actually you know, really starts in the kind of the late Roman world out of paganism and really has a revival when you get to the early Renaissance. But the change, at least theoretically, is if you could take a, a substance like lead and somehow remove its form, if you could take the form of lead out of the material and just reduce it, right, to its base matter, that's the albedo stage, right, dissolution, and then to purification, or the dissolution is the negredo stage, which would be removing the form, the albedo stage would be purifying the base matter, and then at the end, the rubedo is when you put in a new form and purify it and perfect it, rather, okay, so that's the idea of the, the transformation. So if that's theoretically possible, then I guess alchemy would work, right? If you could take the form of lead out, put it in the form of gold, the same matter now becomes something different and valuable. 
Uh, ultimately, it was a failure. I mean, I don't think there were any alchemists that actually succeeded in turning lead to gold as far as I know. But again, this idea, as it is used now for maybe literary explanation, really is the same thing we've been looking at all along, a hero's transformation in three stages. Now, since Rawling uses you know, alchemy in various places, let's take a look at how she does this, and we can say that Harry is the element that's going to be purified. Now, before we get to that, let's take a look at the Platonic Trinity one more time. All right, this is the idea of Plato's soul, which is represented very often in groups of three heroes. Right? We keep seeing this over and over and over again, like Lake, uh, Luke, Leia, and Han in Star Wars, or um, Bones, Spock, and McCoy. I'm sorry, Bones is McCoy. Uh, Bones, Spock, and Kirk in Star Trek. The different parts of Plato's soul, if you remember, are the noetic, thumotic, and epithumotic parts of the soul, which are, again, the reason the spirit, and the appetite. And if you're going to put them into a location within the body, that would be the head, the heart, and the belly. All right, we saw the same thing when we did Chronicles of Narnia with Eustace, Lucy, and Edmund. Now, I think it's easy to figure out who is going to be each of these in the Harry Potter world. I think we have even dealt with this way back when we did the introduction to hero myths. So at the top, the most rational of the group, the three friends, is going to be Hermione Granger. Okay, she is clearly the, the rational one. She's the, the academic, right? That's her passion. She's the most studious of the three. Then you've got the appetite, which I think would be represented by Ron. Um, Ron Weasley is more emotional than the others. He is all, often has his uh, feelings hurt. He's very often at odds with Harry over really petty things, jealousies of different sorts. So he's clearly more on the emotional side of the spectrum. So he clearly lines up with the appetite. And then you've got Harry, who we already know is going to be the central character, as his spirit usually is. So he's the main focus here. And he's the one that kind of brings the group together, right? He actually brings the whole story together. So there you've got the new platonic trinity in Harry Potter. But now I want to take a look at them as part of this alchemical process. Because when it comes to alchemy, the alchemical transformation required not just the element that was being perfected. And that's going to be Harry, right? He's the object who's being transformed over the course of the story. But there were catalysts that were used in the process. There were actually two catalysts used in alchemy. Um, now, one of them was mercury and one of them was sulfur. Okay, one is hot, one is cold. And you can probably figure who represents each of those elements in this trinity. You've got mercury, I think, is Hermione, and I think sulfur would be Ron. Now, why that particular view? Why isn't, wasn't the opposite? Well, I think, again, Rowling is doing things very intentionally as she puts the story together. So, you know, Ron, he's kind of hot-tempered, right? He's the emotional one. He is, uh, you know, red-headed. He's from a red-headed family. So you got this idea of redness. So sulfur, heat, I think that's going to be Ron. The thing that really nails it, though, is when you look at Hermione. Very clearly, she is related to the idea of mercury in a few different ways. As a rational character, she is definitely cool for the most part. Not that she doesn't have emotions like everybody else, but she's the cool one of the group. You also have the idea of her name. Uh, if you look at a peri periodical chart of elements, uh, Mercury is represented by the initials HG. Her name happens to be Hermione Granger. Okay, I don't think by accident. The other thing is her first name, Hermione all by itself, happens to be a version of the Greek word Hermes. And if you again know your Greek mythology and Roman mythology, you know that the Greek god Hermes counterpart in Roman mythology is the Roman god Mercury. So very clearly her name is Mercury. Okay, so not directly, but again, very clear. So again, this is an alchemical transformation and heroic transformation at the same time. But she doesn't just use that little bit of alchemy as she draws her story. She puts little glimpses of things in other places that I think are neat to just look at briefly. So she uses alchemical symbolism um, as we get closer to the full manifestation of hero, uh, here, huh, getting tongue tied, Harry as a hero. Now, you know, in a hero story, the mentors need to depart if the hero is going to emerge. And in the first number of books, you've got a lot of mentors that are counseling Harry. Of course, his adventures usually take place without their assistance, with a few exceptions. But near, nearing the end, we know he needs to be on his own, right? That's essential. Sometimes the mentor will die, as Obi-Wan Kenobi did in the very first Star Wars film. Rowling does the same thing here. But she does it in an interesting way that is going to be reminiscent of the chemical or alchemical process. So let's take a look 
and how she does this. The last three books of the series you can think of as the crucible of transformation. This is where the most intense things happen, the most devastating moments in Harry's life occur, with the exception, of course, of the death of his parents as a child. Now, Order of the Phoenix, the fifth book, I think is the Negredo stage, and we can come to that conclusion, I think, because the major character that dies in the fifth book happens to be the character known as Sirius Black. Now, every stage of the alchemical process, I probably didn't point this out, but has a color associated with it, which is why I color-coded them a second ago. The Negredo stage, the word literally refers to the black phase. Okay, so in this book, which we can call the Negredo phase, you have the black character dying, and that's serious black. Okay, now, anyways, the next stage, I think, comes in book six, where you're looking at the albedo stage. Albedo means white. Now, clearly, the character that dies in this book is the most important character in Harry's life, really, and that's going to be Albus Dumbledore. His first name is right there, Albus, the white wizard. Okay, He dies in book six, so that is your um, <clears throat> albedo phase, and then that leaves us with the final rubedo phase, which is going to be book seven. So can you find a character who dies who's related to the word rubedo? Okay, the red character. Well, there's a couple different suggestions I guess we could make as to who this might be. Uh, there is a character who dies who happens to be red in a certain way. I mean, he's got red hair. His name has the word red in it. And that happens to be Fred Weasley. He meets a tragic death at the end. But he's not a major character. So I don't think that's who Rowling had in mind if she's trying to do this kind of um, you know, symbolic thing. You could think maybe Snape. I mean, Snape dies in that book as well, and he happens to be the half-blood prince. So again, this idea of blood and redness might be connected. Perhaps it's Snape. Um, I think personally that it happens to be Hagrid. All right, Hagrid's first name is Rubius. Now, Hagrid, of course, doesn't die in the last book, but he is the only character present at the most important death scene of all, which is when Harry dies. He's the only one with him at the death. So I think that's your rubedo phase, right? And the stage of perfection as well, because Harry is going to come back, again, more powerful. So we can, you can also throw in a photo of Snape, because his death, of course, is significant and important as well. All right. And there are lots of other things that you could add, right? She doesn't just end there. Obviously, the first book, The Philosopher's Stone, you know, comes from The Philosopher's Stone, which is a, uh, you know, part of the alchemical goal. Uh, Nicholas Flamel, the guy who actually has possession of the Philosopher's Stone, is uh, the name of an actual 14th century alchemist who lived in Paris, France. Um, Hermione, again, her name, we've already talked about it with connection to Hermes, but the uh, patron of uh, alchemy from the ancient world was uh, the figure, mythological figure by the name of Hermes Trismegistus. So again, you get this idea of Hermes and Hermione. You also have within the medieval tradition, the idea of having patron saints over different things. Well, alchemy itself had a patron saint, happens to be St. James. Again, Harry's father is James. Now, the other mother, I'm sorry, the other parent, rather, of Harry happens to be his mother, and that, that's Lily Potter. Now, Lily was also a nickname for the second stage of alchemy, the um, albedo phase. Remember, a lily is, a, is a, a beautiful white flower, as we saw at Narnia, right, as they entered the Silver Sea at the very end of the journey, this stage of purification. So a lily represents purification, which is exactly what happened in stage two of the alchemical process. So he, she really litters the entire story with little glimpses of symbols, uh, alchemy here, alchemy there, a lot of things going on in the story that would probably... Um, most people would just miss that don't know what to look for. And matter of fact, this is not stuff that I came up with on my own. I mean, I am well versed in the hero's journey and I know how to identify different stages there. But when it comes to alchemy, that's not you know a strong point in my um, education. So um, I you saw how other people were uncoding things and a lot of it was like, wow, this is really amazing. So you know, a while back I started teaching that way in my classes. And I usually have at the end of the semester a number of students that come up to me uh, that were huge Harry Potter fans and all of a sudden have seen things in a new way and realized how much Rowling put into the work. It's not just a good story. It's a really well thought out story. Um, you can tell how creative she is, even with names. And again, think about it you and know, go back and read the story, watch the movies. You're going to see how much is pulled from mythology, how much is pulled from various religious traditions. This is an incredibly rich work. But again, it's not easy to unpack if you're not if you don't know what to look for. So. With that, I think we've wrapped up our last lecture in our investigation of hero myths, everything from Gilgamesh all the way through to Harry Potter. So it's, 
you know, 4,000 plus years of hero myths, and we only scratched the surface. So hopefully you got a good uh, idea of how to look at these stories, how these stories are structured, the importance and value of these stories, and can go off now and look at other stories down the road, and hopefully they'll have a lot more meaning for you now that you've had a little bit of a background.